All right, thanks for tuning in here. We're going to take a look at toxicology, which is the study of the toxicity of chemicals and how we can use that information to manage risk. This presentation will help you understand a study of hazards and their effects, risk assessment and risk management, and policy and regulation. So first of all, toxicants can take many routes through the environment. It all starts with manufacturing the chemicals in a factory. Maybe they go into consumer products and those consumer products find our way to our home. From there, they might outgas. So we might breathe some of these chemicals into our body or some of these chemicals, pesticides and whatnot are applied to a field. Then from there, they might go into the food that we eat or it might go into the water and the water might be then drunk by an animal and we might end up eating that animal. So there are many different ways that these chemicals flow through our um, environment and uh, many different ways in which they get into our system through medications, through workplace exposure, the water we drink, the air we breathe. Um, and once they're in our bodies, they also can go into the bodies of our developing fetuses, of our babies. So this is an important topic when we talk about environmental health. Toxicants concentrate in water. If you think about surface water and groundwater, they can accumulate toxins because we're dealing with runoff from large areas of land, which we call the watershed, that drains into water bodies, becoming concentrated. So you might have an entire side of a mountain and if that rain coming down or if there are any contaminants on that land, it's going to um, all flow into one main creek, flowing into one, one uh, main uh, pond or lake. So toxicants in groundwater or surface water reservoirs used for drinking water pose potential risk to human health. If we have toxicants which get into our groundwater, that's water that we pump up through our wells and then ultimately end up drinking. That can be bad. So who are the most contaminated people on the planet? You would think it maybe would be people living in cities, but au contraire. It's uh, the Inuit, which are the people, the Native Americans of Northern America in the Arctic area. And uh, we find PCBs, which are a certain class of chemical toxicant, are carried thousands of miles from developed nations where they're used, of the temperate zone, up to the Arctic, where they are found in tissues of polar bears and seals. Inuit people who then get, eat the polar bears and seals accumulate these toxins in their own bodies. So this can be a kind of an ironic thing that they are the ones least using technology, yet they're the ones who are most affected by it in terms of their health. So this concept we just described is called the grasshopper effect, where airborne toxicants can move halfway around the globe and then concentrate. So what we have happening here is um, toxicants can evaporate. So um, there's my cursor. Toxicants can, um, can evaporate in areas where it's warmer, and um, so they go into the air, and sometimes they'll be deposit back down through you know, rain, snow, whatnot. But once they're in the air, <clears throat> a lot of them will get carried by atmospheric currents up into more northern regions um, near the poles, and there, through snowfall or rainfall or whatnot, they will deposit. And because it's colder here, you have a lower rate of evaporation, so we have in overall, the net effect is pollutants evaporating from warmer areas, getting carried up to colder areas, and then getting deposited. And the same can be true for ocean currents, which can pick up these chemicals and bring them to other parts of the globe. So that's why we get a high concentration of chemicals at the poles. Grasshopper effect. Starts one area, and jumps to another. Okay, let's take a look at the idea of persistence of these molecules. Some chemicals are more stable than others, persisting for longer in the environment. For example, DDT and PCBs are persistent. They can take literally 30 or more years to break down, very strong molecules. Whereas BT toxin in GM crops is not persistent, and it breaks down pretty quickly. What breaks them down? 
temperature, high temperatures, um, moisture, sun exposure, the strong UV rays of the sun, etc., can all affect the rate of degradation. And most toxic against degrade into simpler breakdown products, and some of these are also toxic. For example, DDT breaks down to DDE, which is also toxic. Poisons can accumulate in tissues. So they're in the environment, some of them lasting for a long time, and they find their way into our bodies through the air we drink, air we breathe, food we drink, <laughs> food we eat, water we drink. And the body may excrete, degrade, or store these toxicants depending on the situation. Ideally, we excrete them. Um, our liver will degrade them, and, um, and then hopefully our body excretes the breakdown products. Um, but sometimes we store them, not, um, not in, a, um, in a good way, but they get stored inadvertently in the fat tissue of our bodies. So fat-soluble ones are stored in body fat. And what are some fat-soluble ones? DDT is persistent, lasting for a long time in the environment, and it's fat-soluble. So it can build up in tissues, which we call bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulated chemicals may be passed on to animals that eat the organism up the food chain. So let's take a look at a little video clip of this. We have a fish coming and eating food that contains some kind of a toxicant. And you can see that toxicant is building up inside of its body. Bioaccumulation. Now, let's take a look at what happens if another bigger fish comes and lets, eats this fish? So here we have many little fish, all storing some level of that toxicant. This guy's getting hungry, yep. Mmm, yummy. Now he's stored that. Uh-oh, here comes the big daddy fish. And as he's eating all these fish, and keep in mind, he has to eat a lot of little fish in order to satisfy his nutritional requirements. So each little fish that he eats, he's going to be absorbing some of those toxicants. And they're going to get accumulated in his body. So who has more accumulated toxins, the little fish or the big fish? So we see at each trophic level, chemical concentration increases. And we call this biomagnification. And so DDT concentrations increase from plankton to fish to fish eating birds. Here we have some water. And this water might have some uh, chemical, maybe some DDT residue <clears throat> from runoff from, a, um, from an agricultural field. And then the phytoplankton <clears throat> get that DDT into their bodies, which is eaten by zooplankton, small fish, large fish, and finally osprey. And if you look at these DD concentrations in parts per million, very small but getting bigger, and getting bigger by approximately a factor of 10, and this is related to that 10% rule, if you remember back to um, our unit on um, community interactions, that it takes about 10 times the body mass at the lower trophic level to meet the needs of the higher trophic level. This is biomagnification. Keep in mind that not all toxicants are synthetic. We were talking about DDT and other insecticides, but um, Toxicolo although toxicology tends to focus on man-made chemicals, it's important to keep in mind that there are plenty of natural toxicants. Think about like poisonous mushrooms, for example. And many are toxins produced by animals or plants for protection against predators and pathogens. Um, even women who are pregnant often get morning sickness from eating vegetables like broccoli because they become more sensitive to those toxins that are present in, um, in vegetables. And cooking vegetables is one way to break down those toxins. Um, studying effects of hazards. All right, so we know that there are toxicant molecules that present hazards, but there are other kind of, um, yeah, we can study these in different ways. Wildlife toxicology studies is one way, <clears throat> or we can do human epidemiological, epidemiological studies, or dose response studies in the lab, which is basically um, animal testing. So let's take a look at wildlife toxicology. It can be used to determine the causes of mortality in die-off events. So like the example of the condor, who was dying off from the presence of DDT. This would be an example of wildlife toxicology, how we led to that conclusion. Or sometimes we, um, let's skip through this part. You don't have to pay attention to that. Uh, but ultimately, let's take a look at the bottom part. Ultimately, we are trying to correlate chemical presence in the environment 
an animal presence in the field. In other words, what's happening to the animals? Is there a chemical reason for that? All right, the other way that we analyze toxic effects is through human epidemiology. And human studies rely on case history, observation and analysis of individual patients. For example, someone who is exposed to a toxin. Maybe um, they drink a certain poison no one's drank before, now you have a case history of what can happen. <clears throat> or epidemiological studies are long-term, large-scale comparisons of different groups of people. And for example, the Mad Hatters. These are people who, back in the early 1900s, were making hats from felt. And the way you make felt is using mercury. And so they actually had major neurological disorders, were kind of going crazy, or what we would say, mad. So they were the Mad Hatters. And also, it relies on some um, animal testing as well. So the advantages of this type of um, uh, environmental health studies or toxicology studies is that they're realistic. You're dealing with humans. And all real life factors are therefore included. The disadvantage is you're looking at statistical correlation only. It does not prove causation. In other words, we're looking for patterns, but patterns don't always indicate what is the cause and what's the effect. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell what's the cause and what's the effect. And it can take many years to get results from this. So here's an interesting one. Um, children were tested for pesticide effects. There's an area in Mexico there where students living uh, in the foothills are generally not exposed to some of the insecticides that are being used there. And we see drawings that are pretty typical for four-year-olds and five-year-olds. Then we have areas that are not too far away from there in the valley where there's a greater amount of pesticide runoff getting into the water supply there. And here we see drawings by exposed children, same ages, four years old and five years old. And you can see the difference in their neurological development. This was um, a striking uh, case study. And we have another way of analyzing toxicity of chemicals, the dose response analysis. So in this, it's a method of determining toxicity of a substance by measuring response to different doses. And lab animals are used. So we give these lab animals, maybe a set of 100 of them, um, different doses, and we see what dose um, causes lethality, causes death, or some effect. And mice and rats are usually used because they breed quickly and they give data relevant to humans because they are mammals like us. We have to say relevant to humans, not identical to humans, because they aren't us. And they do have slightly, they do have different physiology, but we're both mammals, so we have a lot in common. Responses to doses are plotted on a dose response curve. Let's take a look at one of these. So what are our two variables here? On the horizontal we have dose, going from low to high. On our vertical, we have percentage of test population killed by the dose. So we can see that at a low dosage, there um, we're not killing any of the members of our test sample, test population. But then there reaches a threshold at which you start to see some percentage of those animals being tested dying. And uh, oftentimes, but not um, definitely not in each case, it's a linear. Um, response. Actually, I'm not even going to say mostly. Sometimes it's a linear response. And so this threshold is the dose at which a response begins. In this case, the response is death of some members of that test population. Now, there's an important number here called the LD50. This is the dose that's lethal to 50% of the test animals. So this is something you definitely need to know. And um, so basically, we would start here. We would look at where is 50%, go across, where is it our curve, drop down and boom that's the dose level at which 50 percent of them will die and it's just a useful measure for comparing the toxicity of different chemicals so you repeat this this kind of test for a variety of chemicals and you can see which are more toxic than others these dose response curves allow us to predict the effects of higher doses and by extrapolating the curve out to higher values, we can predict how toxic a substance may be to humans at various concentrations. So that's where we're taking tests on small animals and trying to extrapolate. Well, what does this mean for humans? What amount would be um, lethal for humans or toxic to humans? And in most curves, the response increases with dose, but this is not always the case. Um, with endocrine disruption, it may actually decrease as the body's defense system begins to recognize it as foreign. 
So what are we saying? We're saying that sometimes with the endocrine disruptors, a greater dose will actually cause a lesser um, or less lethal response. Because remember, the endocrine system works on very small, minute concentrations. So a very small concentration of that endocrine disruptor molecule might um, go unnoticed by the body and it might just think of it as the regular hormone. But if it gets to be too high of a concentration, then the body might start to realize, okay, there's definitely something coming in here. This is not natural. It's not part of my system. And then it begins to mount um, a proper response to that, helping to rid the body of it. What are some factors that affect toxicity? Keep in mind, not all people are equal. And sensitivity to toxicity can vary with sex, age, weight, etc. Babies and older people, however, or those in poor health are most sensitive. Babies breathe a lot more. Um, they, um, yeah, they have more times that they're breathing in and out. So whereas an adult might make um, you know, maybe 20 breaths per minute, babies might make three times that. And because they're also developing, the effects of those toxins can be more severe. And it depends also on the type of exposure people are getting. These are two words you need to know. First one is acute, the high ex which means high exposure in a short period of time. So like you drank, um, you drank unknowingly you drank some poison, or you, um, you got some chemical spilled on you or something like that. Versus chronic, means, which means lower amounts over a long period of time. So like a smoker could experience chronic um, issues with toxicity because they're getting a little bit of those um, chemicals that are in the cigarette smoke exposed over a long period of time. And mixtures of toxicants. Substances may interact when they're combined together. Mixes of toxicants may cause effects greater than the sum of their individual effects. We have a name for this. It's called synergistic effects or synergy. And it can be it can be a really challenging problem for toxicology because there's no way to test all possible combinations. We saw one example of this. Um, let's say the and the environment contains complex mixtures of many toxicants. One other example that we saw with synergism, uh, if you remember a section that we read about uh, amphibians being good indicator species. So they did that test where they put a toxic chemical into the water that the um, amphibians were living in, and they found that that wasn't causing such a problem until they added the stress of having a predator also present in that same habitat. And so the combination of being under stress made them more sensitive to the, um, to the toxin. So that's an example of synergy. So what do we mean when we say risk? This, we want to know all these things so that we can evaluate how dangerous something is. Risk means the mathematical probability that some harmful outcome will result from a given action, event, or substance. Probability means a quantitative description of the likelihood of a certain outcome. If something is 100% probable or has a probability of 100%, it's, um, you pretty much know it's going to happen. 0%, not going to happen. Harmful outcome could be defined as injury, death, environmental damage, economic loss, etc. So it depends on the situation. A um, little FYI here, perception is often different from reality. Our perception of risk tends not to match statistical reality. What's one of the most dangerous things, dangerous things that most people think of? Airplane accidents. A lot of people are deathly afraid of flying in an airplane. You pretty much know if that airplane is going to crash, your chances of survival are slim. But what are your chances of a crash? Pretty small. Whereas take smoking 20 cigarettes a day. That um, is something that many people in our population uh, are willing to do to their bodies. They don't perceive it as that great of a risk. But look at the, the um, loss of life expectancy in days. By undergoing that kind of behavior, you are taking 2,370 days off of your life. That's like, hmm, if I do some quick mental math, um, 36... 50 would be 10 years, so we're talking like 7 years off your life. So let's take a look at risk assessment again. It analyzes risk quantitatively. It measures and compares risk involved in different activities or substances. And it helps identify and prioritize serious risks. It helps determine threats posed to humans, wildlife, and ecosystems. This is a difficult, it's a difficult um, task, but it's necessary and it relies on statistics. You don't have to go, we're not gonna go into detail on this. Try to get the general idea here, but you don't have to take real specific notes here. Sci 
assessing the risk is helped by having scientific results and measurement of probability. So these results might come from those dose analysis curves or the epidemiological studies um, and uh, the scientific data from things that we just talked about. Extent of the exposure to whatever toxin you are exposed to, hazard identification, identifying what they are, toxicity characterization. So it involves mostly a dose response analysis or other tests of toxicity. So that's the first thing. How toxic is the chemical? Second thing, assessing the level of exposure to the hazard. What was the concentration of it? How long was the exposure time? How frequently does this exposure occur? And um, risk management considers risk assessments in light of social, economic, and political needs and values. You know, we might know that, um, let's give you the example of um, clothing. Children's sleepwear contains a fiber that, um, or a chemical added to the fiber that reduces the flammability of the fabric. And that is, that has some level of toxicity to it. But maybe you're going to accept that level of risk considering that if you don't, there's a greater chance that that child may actually um, be caught in a fire during the middle of the night and burn. So this is really about weighing costs and benefits using scientific and non-scientific concerns and deciding whether or not to reduce or eliminate a risk. So what level, what level of risk are we able to accept for some benefit? And policy making is complicated, but we're taking risk assessment. We're looking at risk management. Um, you know, how can we try to reduce um, exposure? How can we try to reduce the possibility of accidents happening? We're looking at um, private citizens and their concerns, the concerns of industry and manufacturing that need some of these chemicals to make a product that's effective. Nonprofit interest group that might be looking out for the environment, and they might be funded by, um, you know, they're nonprofits, so they're funded by taxpayer money or something else. And ultimately, you're trying to come up with some policy. What kind of chemicals are we going to allow to go into our environment, and what are we not going to allow? There's some philosophical approaches to risk management for making that ultimate decision. One is, the chemical is innocent until proven guilty. Assume it harmless until it's shown to be harmful. The other is the precautionary principle. You assume it's harmful until it's shown to be harmless. So it's the opposite approach. So let's take a look at this graph here. Um, well, the basic idea is you are t you're bringing a chemical to the marketplace, and um, it's going along. You get it out there, and so forth, so forth. All of a sudden, you realize, oh my gosh, it actually has some problems. It's not safe, and so then you recall it. There are regulations, and you begin to ban it. But at that point, there may have already been some damage. That's the innocent until proven guilty. Whereas the precautionary principle is saying, we have to assume that any unknown chemical or new chemical um, might be dangerous. And so we have to do rigorous testing to ensure it's safe before we bring it to the marketplace. But of course, that's going to have some economic disadvantage to it. You're slowing down economic development. You're, you are um, extending the time before a new product can come on the market. So industry has pressured government to take on innocent until proven guilty approach. Whereas environmental advocates have pressured government to follow the precautionary principle. And um, there are certain federal agencies that help to um, decide on the policies and decide what we will allow. In the U.S., most risk management is conducted by federal and state agencies, particularly the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. So let's take a look at um, these key agencies and what they regulate. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, monitors food, additives, cosmetics, drugs, and medical devices. But interesting point here, the FDA does not have to, um, to test GM products because it's just food. It's not a food additive. Um, if you have corn, of course corn's safe. We've been eating it for centuries. If you have GM corn, there has been a ruling uh, in the Supreme Court that said that GM crops are similar enough to their, um, to their natural counterparts that they don't have to be tested. The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, they're looking at pesticides, industrial chemicals, and any synthetic chemicals not covered by other agencies to see whether they're going to be safe for use or to regulate how much of them can be used to manage that risk. 
And then Occupational Health and Safety Administration, also called OSHA, deals with the workplace hazards. Making sure that you have, um, you know, uh, well, think about your science rooms. You see that um, the, uh, the shower, that if you got a chemical on you, you can go to that shower, pull it down, and get bathed in um, really rusty water. But at least you're getting the acid off your body. OSHA would be an organization that would come in and say, you must have one there. You need to know these, by the way. These are um, a few key agencies. We don't need to know many in APES, but these are three of them you do. All right, so let's take a look at EPA regulation of pesticides. Pesticides to be introduced in the market in the U.S. need to be registered with EPA. You can't just go on spraying anything. Registration involves risk assessment and risk management. So there is um, a measurement of the toxicity of the, um, of the chemical. They would do a dose um, response analysis. And the EPA assesses research from the manufacturer along with any outside research. So the manufacturer provides some of their own research. Of course, it's going to be biased. They would like to get their product to the marketplace. Um, uh, but the EPA can set restrictions on the use or even ban a product. So let's look at the regulation of industrial chemicals. The EPA is charged with monitoring 75,000 industrial chemicals. They are, these are too many chemicals and too little time, people, and resources to actually test all them or, um, or in, a, in a substantial way. So only 10% of the chemicals on the market are thoroughly tested. All of them are tested to some degree, but um, to a large degree, a superficial degree. And only 2% of these um, are screened for car actually no, 2% of the overall are screened for carcinogens, mutagens, and teratogens. Less than 1% are government regulated. In other words, the other ones have no restriction. You can use as much as you want. And 0% are tested for endocrine, nervous, or immune effects. And none of them are tested for synergistic effects. None of them. Yet, there, um, there are a countless number of synergistic effects you can get from all these different chemicals and the way they interact within our bodies. But that is just a way too big ball of wax. So, a little FYI here. They put together a list of the dirty dozen, which are POPs, persistent organic, um, persistent organic phosphates. Um, it's a certain class of chemical that are very persistent, and they're used mostly as insecticides. You don't have to know these names, but you'll recognize there's DDT and um, dioxins or other major chemicals, and um, PCBs are also down here. They're an industrial chemical used in the electronics industry. And um, anyway, so these are these are big ones that we know are really toxic, and that we need to manage carefully or ban. PCBs we use still, DDT we don't. So um, so that's my introduction to you. Um, I know that's kind of quick, but uh, about toxicology and how we can assess the toxicity and use those results to help manage some of our policies and um, and uh, yeah, our regulations. So please take a moment to do a summary in your notes and. Um, uh, hopefully you can incorporate some of these ideas into your upcoming debates. All right, see you in class.